you have found that, follow along as I read. Read the first five verses. Book of Titus, starting in chapter number one. It reads, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began, but hath in due time manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus uh, Christ our Savior. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain the elders in every city, as I have appointed thee. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, your word. We thank you, Lord, for the Apostle Paul that uh, wrote so many of uh, the books of the Bible that we read and we can gain and glean so much from. Just pray, Lord, that you'd help us as over the course of the next few weeks we study in the book of Titus, Lord, that you would teach us, Lord, what we need to know, Lord, about keeping the church set in order, about our part uh, in the church, Lord, and how uh, we should uh, treat uh, our elders and for those that are in authority. Lord, I just pray, God, that you would just bless uh, tonight. If we ask this in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, pastor asked, uh, right after he got done with Revelation, said, would you like to teach a series? I said, absolutely. And uh, uh, I actually have preached this message before. How many of you guys remember when I preached this message? It was in September. And I got ready to preach the second part of this four or five part message. I still haven't figured it out yet. I was supposed to preach it in October. And something happened. And I didn't get to preach that night. So I told him, I said, yes, I would love to preach a series so I could finally get through all of this. So we're going to start back from the beginning. And uh, uh, since nobody raised their hand and said that they remembered, I, I'm, I'm really just, I should be heartbroken, but really I'm not And uh, in that. So let's find out what Paul has to say about the book of Titus. Now, the epistle of Paul to Titus was written uh, to one of Paul's sons in the faith by the name of Titus. He was most likely led to Christ by Paul, as we see in, uh, in verse 4. He says to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith. And, uh, and he probably won him as he was traveling through Macedonia. Uh, Titus was a Greek or a Gentile believer and was personally taught and nurtured by Paul in the faith. Boy, could you think of a better teacher uh, that you could have in history outside of Jesus Christ himself than to, to get to sit at the feet of Paul to follow Paul around and get to see uh, all the different things that, that he taught. Now Titus uh, was with Paul when he had come to Jerusalem. If you want to, turn to Galatians, if you would, please. Uh, chapter number 2, keep your, your uh, uh, place there in, uh, in Titus. But in Galatia, uh, something happened uh, there. And it says uh, this, starting in uh, chapter number 2 of Galatia, Galatians. excuse me. It says... Uh, then, 14 years after I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me, and I went up uh, by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles. He's talking, uh, preaching to the Jews. And uh, he had, had already preached to the Jews. They rejected him. He went to the Gentiles. And now he is back in Jerusalem again, and he's preaching uh, to the Jews. He says, was I preached among the Gentiles, but uh, uh, privately to uh, them which were of the uh, reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled uh, to be circumcised. And because of the false brethren unawares brought in that came privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ, that they might bring us into bondage. And uh, what had taken place there is that while Paul and, and uh, uh, Titus were in Jerusalem, some dogmatic Jewish believers insisted that Titus, a Gentile, be circumcised. Paul wouldn't have it. He said it's not going to happen. And he wouldn't allow it because that would have suggested that all the non-Jewish 
Christians were second-class citizens in the church. And that's just not true. God sees us all the same. And uh, we are told in Ephesians, very familiar passage of Scripture, for by grace are you saved through what? Through faith. Not, uh, not um, excuse me. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Paul said we're not going to have that. Uh, we're not going to have people identify as Jews. We are all Christians. We are little Christ uh, in that. So he, he refused to, to let that uh, be done. Now Titus uh, remained Paul's trusted traveling companion and close friend. Now as they traveled together to do the mission work in the east, they landed on the island of Crete. Now Crete is the second largest island in the uh, eastern Mediterranean Sea. There Paul preached and he evangelized in several towns. Now however, since Paul was unable to stay, he left Titus. He had been training Titus and uh, uh, to, to take up uh, his mantle. He left Titus behind uh, to complete the organization of the congregations uh, in that region. Now Titus met with considerable opposition, as we will find out as we study through this book, and insubordination in the church, especially from the Jews from the, uh, uh, that were there. Uh, it was quite possible that Titus had written Paul to report the problem and ask for, um, and ask for spiritual advice. Now Paul responded in this short, encouraging letter uh, to him to complete, uh, encouraged him to complete the process of organization and ordained elders or pastors in the churches and to exercise his own authority firmly. In other words, to, to just stiffen up that backbone and just face it head on. Uh, to, to, to be a man is basically what, uh, what he is telling him to do. And to teach sound doctrine, uh, which uh, avoiding and, and try to avoid unnecessary strife. That's a lot for a young preacher. We're going to find out in January, aren't we? <laughs> I know I am. Yes, I realize I've been here for a while. But it's going to be totally different. That's why we're studying Titus. <laughs> I told God, I said, I need help and, uh, in that. And uh, so it's there. Now, it is believed that Paul penned this letter sometime between his first and second imprisonment in Rome. Uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was about the same time that he wrote uh, the book of 1 Timothy. Now, the instructive tone of this epistle uh, to Titus is similar to that of Paul's first letter to Timothy. If you were to study them side by side, you would pick up uh, the things that, that are the same. Now, Paul exhorts Titus to continue to preach sound doctrine. He said, you just preach the word. Let God take care of the rest. You preach the word. You preach that sound doctrine. And to use wise judgment concerning appointing the leaders of the church. And we'll get into that uh, next week. So let's, let's take a look at Paul's long introduction uh, that he has. Now, we see, number one, that Paul was humble in his authority. Uh, look again at verse, number, uh, at verse number one back in Titus. He says, Paul, he, well, the way they addressed their letters back then, of course, they, they started there. Usually when we write a letter, we put dear, we start out with dear Titus and then sign it at the end. Well, here, uh, uh, the way they wrote their letters, they started out with who was writing. And then he talked about two titles that he has. He says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. He recognized himself as a servant of God. Now, the common way to begin a letter in Paul's day, like I said, was the introduction of the author uh, by name and title. And uh, uh, he could have just said, I'm Paul the apostle because that's who he was. I'm Paul the, the church starter, the church planter. He could have said that. But instead, how did he identify himself? I'm a servant. I'm a servant. He said that he was a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. First, he considered his position before God as a servant. This is not just a worker, but one who was born into slavery. Now, back in this day, they had slaves. And if you were to go to the Middle East today, one of the things I was surprised about when I was <clears throat> in Desert Storm in Saudi Arabia is that they still have indentured servants today. <coughs> Not treated very well and uh, uh, oftentimes very mistreated. 
Uh, but they, they come from, from, from the different uh, countries from around because Saudi Arabia is a very uh, rich country. But uh, uh, they come. And Paul here was said that, that, that he was a servant. And, he, and a servant, or that word there, means one who gives himself wholly to another's will. In other words, he said, I'm all in as a servant of Jesus Christ. There's just not part of me. There's just not some of me. I'm all in. I am a servant. I am, I am wholly belonging to God. This was Paul's view of himself in uh, relation to God and ought to be for every Christian. It should be said of all of us. Rick, the servant, the slave of Jesus Christ. Now, we, we think of that word slave, we think of it in a negative connotation. But here Paul was saying, I willfully give myself to Jesus Christ. And as he was writing this, he was reminding Paul, or he was reminding Titus that, uh, that, that Paul considered himself a servant and uh, Titus should as well. And then secondly, he uh, called himself an apostle. Now an apostle is defined this, one sent forth or a messenger. In other words, he was a chosen, uh, he was one chosen and sent with a special commission as a fully authorized representative of the sender. Now you think about it. Who was sending Paul? It says so right there. He's an apostle of who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ taught Paul in the backside of the desert. He taught Paul exactly what he needed to do. That's why Paul was such an amazing preacher and such a, uh, an amazing church planter uh, that he was. Uh, he considered himself a servant of God, a slave of God, but also he was once sent with authority and he wasn't afraid to use that authority that he had and he didn't misuse it in any way. He said, I have a message and that message is coming from Jesus Christ himself through the word of God. He identified himself that way. Now, in Paul's case, this was uh, Jesus Christ. His authority came from God, and he planned to serve God and others with it. And the second thing that we see uh, in his humble authority is this. Not only did he, he recognize himself as a servant, but he recognized the importance of his faith. Look at the second part of verse number 1 down into verse number 2. He says, according to the faith of God's elect... And the acknowledging of the truth, which is after what? Godliness. What does it mean to be godly? To be like him. To be like God. To have those attributes that God has. When we think of God, what's the first thing we think of when we think of God? God is what? Love. We should be loving. We should have a loving spirit. Now, because we have a sinful heart and because we are sinful men, sometimes we have a hard time loving people. I've told my kids before, I'll always love you. There are days I just don't like you. Anybody ever been there? Okay. Thank you. I'm glad I'm not alone. Okay. Uh, in that, and it could even be the same way with our brothers and sisters in Christ. I love you, but boy, I'm telling you right now, I don't like you very much. Jesus Christ is never that way. He is always loving. He may not like what we're doing, but he is always loving to us. And Paul says that we need to be godly. What else is an attribute of God? God is also what? He's holy. He doesn't do sin. It's not allowed in his presence. And we should be the same. And we can go through all the attributes of God and, uh, 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 that, we can, that, that we can possess, the holiness and, and things like that. But here, as he is talking, he said that uh, he was made an apostle according to the faith of Christ and his acknowledgement or recognition of God's truth, not man's perception of the truth. Now, we live in a very peculiar world. Uh, this morning I, I was getting ready and I heard some news report where some judge said that, uh, that, that if you don't believe that, that gay marriage is right, there's something wrong with you. And I'm like going, there's nothing wrong with me because my authority comes from here. And God says, it's a no-no. It's real easy to understand. Nature itself teaches you that it's wrong. God's creation teaches you that. 
Yeah, we have people that just want to have their own way. So their perception is, well, if I don't like the rule, I'll just change it. Your kids ever tried that with you? How well did it go over? Not well, huh? He said, hey, he says, listen, I have the word of God to, to, to back me up. He says, it's a recognition of God's truth. And we need to recognize that the word of God is God's truth. Look at verse number two. He says, in hope of eternal life, which God, uh, which that can't, excuse me, that cannot lie, promised before the beginning of the world. He knew that his faith was based upon the promise of God. Let's look at these words here. He says, in hope. That word hope means in confident expectation based on a fact. He says, I have a hope. I love, uh, I can't remember, um, one of the uh, uh, Heartland groups and then also one of the groups that I like to listen to sang a song, I have a hope. Man, my hope is in the Lord. When things go wrong in life, when things aren't going well, my hope is not in me. If my hope is in me, if my hope is in, in man, I'm going to be disappointed every time. But my hope is in the Lord. Because this word hope here is based on the confident, uh, it has confident ex uh, uh, expectation based on fact. It says God cannot lie. God cannot lie. In hope of eternal life in which God that cannot lie promised before the foundation of the world. He says as long as we follow God's plan, as long as we follow God's truth... We'll have that eternal life. Now, it tells us in uh, the book of Hebrews this. It says, Hebrews 6, verses 18 and 19. It says, that by two immutable, and that word immutable means unchangeable things, and which was impossible for God to lie, which might have a strong consolation, which have fled for a refuge to lay hold upon the hope which is set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Man, I'm glad that we have an anchor. When I was uh, in, in the Navy, I never got on a ship till I was attached to the Marine Corps. Funny, isn't it? My dad was on all kinds of ships. He was on targets, then he went on submarines. If you're in the Navy, you'll know what that means. All right? Uh, in that. And, uh, uh, but I remember uh, when we pulled into uh, uh, Sicily, uh, Terramina, Sicily. We had to take Liberty launches in. And uh, there was this uh, uh, little town way up. And you, you, you took these taxi cabs and you went way on, what, way on top. And you can look and you could just see all across the Mediterranean Sea, all across uh, this part of the island. And uh, you could see the active volcano that was right there in, in Terramina uh, smoking uh, up and you're, we're all hoping that it's not going to blow up while we're there uh, uh, in that. And, uh, but I remember sitting up there and looking at the ship. And the ship was anchored in the harbor. It didn't go anywhere. It moved around a lot like this. But because it had that anchor, that anchor was steadfast and sure. Aren't you glad that your hope is in the Lord? It's an anchor. It's steadfast which means unmovable, and it's sure. It's without a doubt. And Paul, as he's saying, hey, he says, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm a servant of the Lord. I have God's truth. It is my hope. It is my anchor. And then he said that uh, 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 in hope of eternal life, God cannot lie, promise. That word promise means this. It means to engage to do something. In other words, God promised something to us. It says, uh, it tells us in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. And then shall the king say unto them at his right hand, Come, ye blessed of the Lord, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Paul said that God promised before the, uh, before the world began. Jesus Christ repeated it, says, Hey, this hope of eternal life was based way before the world ever even came into existence. It says God was going to have hold of us. He knows the beginning from the end. So we see that Paul recognized that he was a servant of God. We see that Paul recognized the importance of his faith. It was steadfast. It was sure. He had that hope. The reason Paul was so successful is because he just believed God. It didn't stop him. 
Man, if he was stoned to death and God gave him another breath, what did he do? He picked himself up, dusted himself off, and just went right on again. I mean, I, I, if somebody tried to stone me to death, I don't think I would go back into town. Well, didn't get to go to heaven this time. I'm just going to keep on going. Most of us, if somebody says something negative about us, we just want to go home, crawl in our bed, pull the covers up over, and, and feel sorry for ourselves. But we're coming to a point in, in, our, in our society as Christians where people don't have respect for people like us anymore. And our little feelings are going to be getting hurt. But does that mean we're going to quit? Why not? I have hope. My hope is in the Lord. It's an anchor. It's steadfast. It's sure. And I have to remind myself of that from time to time. And Paul said, hey, recognize yourself as a servant. Recognize where your faith is. And then thirdly this, you need to recognize the importance of preaching. Look at verse number three. But hath in due times manifested. That word manifested means what? It means to render apparent, to make known. It says, his word through what? Through preaching. Preaching is important. Preaching is important. Preaching is important. Thank you. Okay. You know what? I just find it very curious that people will come to church and do everything but come into preaching. This is where it's at. This is the most important thing. So I was talking to uh, 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 the, the guys this morning. We had our own little staff meeting today. Usually with pastor the last 20 minutes. This one lasted an hour and 20 minutes. Those guys are long-winded, okay, in that we were meeting together talking about just some things, some directions that we want to go and some things that we want to do. But I told them, I said, you know what, we work all week long for one thing, the preaching of God's Word. Everything that we do, every, every activity that we have, everything that we have, all has to do with the preaching of God's Word. The most important thing that happens in this church happens right now here. You know what, if we would just listen to the preaching of God's word, no matter who's bringing it, we would learn something every time. Now sometimes people get up here and we're thinking, oh, I don't want to hear that guy again. You know what, if you have that attitude, you'll get nothing out of it. But if you go into it saying, I'm going to get something out of this, and you go looking, you'll find it. I mean, there are times we throw open our refrigerator, we look inside, and God's blessed us with food, and we go, oh, there's nothing to eat. Your kids ever do that? You're thinking you just went grocery shopping. Man, if you're hungry and you want something, you'll eat something. Man, I've eaten a mayonnaise sandwich before, and it was good. A double mayonnaise with a slice of mayonnaise in between. I liked it. Okay? My mom came up with some strange concoctions. She used to eat bananas and peanut butter. And fluffy stuff. It grossed me out. My wife makes this, this peanut butter syrup type stuff. I used to think it was gross. Then I tasted it one day. I said, mm, that's not bad uh, in that. But you know what? If we go looking for something, we're going to get it out of it. And, and Paul says that it's preaching that God manifests, makes known uh, his word. Now it says in due time. You know what? God has a schedule and that schedule is always on time. It may not meet up with our time. But it's always on time. It's always His time. God's plan is revealed in His Word, and His Word is, ma is manifested or made known through preaching. It says, manifested through the Word, uh, His Word through preaching. I already said the word manifest means to render apparent. That word preaching means this, a proclamation, especially the gospel. Also means to herald or to proclaim. James asked me earlier, he says, can you make an announcement? What was he asking me to do? He wanted me to proclaim something to you. I had something to say, 
Brother James needs to meet with anyone who is on uh, at the track Friday, who's supposed to go to the track Friday, after the service says in, uh, in the Young at Heart room, it is 8, no, it's 7.50 and all is well. You know, I, heralds back in the day, they would say it's 9 o'clock and all is well. Why were they saying that? Nobody was trying to get over the wall. It was all safe uh, in that. But here, the herald through preaching. And that, turn, let's look at a couple of things. Turn with me, if you would, please, to Romans chapter number 10. How important is preaching? It's a familiar passage of Scripture to many of us. I want you to see it uh, for yourself. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse number 13. And it reads, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's part of our Romans road, isn't it? But how are people saved? It says, how then shall they call upon them whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him and whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? It is written, how beautiful are the feet of them which preach uh, the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now I'll be honest with you. One day I was sitting in my house in my own recliner the house that I'm working to pay for, the house that my wife is working to pay for. And one of my children said, Dad, would you please put a pair of socks on? You have the ugliest feet in the world. And they weren't joking. I had to go put socks on. And I'm going, but the Bible says, and that's not what it means. I don't have model feet, okay? Probably model to what's not good. But you know what? It's important that we listen to the preaching of God's Word. The preaching of God's Word. It's important. It's important. And that's why we should bring people in to hear the preaching of God's Word. The heralding of truth. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Turn there if you would please. Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Uh, and he had some, had some things to say about preaching there as well. Is preaching really important to God and the cause of Christ? Well, I believe that it is. Uh, it says, starting in verse 13, four, excuse me, 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest that the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross to them that perish, foolishness. But unto us that are saved, it is the power of God. We come to hear preaching so that we can be energized to go and do what it is that God wants us to do. It's where we receive our power. It says, as it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring, uh, and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where, uh, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Hath God not made foolishness to the wisdom of the world? Verse 21, and after the wisdom of God and the world by the wisdom which knew, uh, knew not God, excuse me, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them which believe. I'm sure people think, you're crazy. You're going to church on a Wednesday night? Why? I'm going to hear the preaching of God's word. The proclamation, it's important. And here, as, 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 uh, as Paul is writing, uh, in his, in, just in his introductory remarks, he's saying he's recognized that there's importance of that preaching, and he's encouraging Titus uh, with that. He says, but then in due time manifested his word through preaching, and is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Committed unto me means this, it's been entrusted to me. It's been entrusted to me to preach. Now, in Paul's case, God directly entrusted him to preach the word. You go to Acts chapter number 9 and verse 15 and verse 20, it says this. But the Lord said unto him, go thy way. He's talking uh, about um, uh, uh, the man, uh, his name just escaped me. That uh, was to go and to, to touch Paul and to give him back his sight. And he said, he said this about Paul. This is what God's saying. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And straightway he preached Christ. And this is talking about Paul in verse 20. Uh, after he'd received his sight and after he'd received 
some teaching. He straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Paul said, God has made me uh, an apostle. He has chosen me uh, to be that. He's entrusted with me the preaching of his word. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, he says this, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Paul understood that his life was to be sold out for God in the ministry. He recognized that he was God's servant. He recognized uh, that, his, uh, that his faith, uh, the importance of his faith in God's word, that it was that anchor, that it was sure, and that he recognized the importance of preaching that word uh, to others. And then uh, lastly for tonight, he recognized the need for fellow laborers. We need each other. One person does not make Cornerstone Baptist Church. It takes all of us collectively to be the church. It takes all of us to, to do the work. And he said it's important to find fellow laborers. He considered Titus his own son in the ministry after the common faith. That word common there means shared by all. Paul was calling him his son in the faith uh, to make a distinction that he was not his biological son. He said, he's my son in, in the common faith. You know what? I, I remember when I first came here listening to a pastor talk about those that were under his ministry as teenagers going out and being pastors and stuff. And I prayed, I said, God, I said, let me have some of that. Let some people come out of my ministry that are going to go into ministry. And the Lord is blessed in that. And I don't say that too fat to pat myself on the back. I'm just saying I, I wanted to do that. I wanted to have a son in the faith. You know how cool it is when James comes into my office to look across there and say, He was in my youth group. I remember taking and going to Bible college his freshman year. Dave and Penny were already gone. And James was crying his eyes out saying, Please, Mr. Salazar, take me home. I can't do this. I'm like, come on, James. You got to man up. All I wanted to do was say goodbye to, to Robert and get out of there. But I took the time. I told him, God can help you do this. God can help you through this. And look at him today. A man of God. And I, I love the fact that there are kids that have come out of the youth group that I had the privilege of teaching. That many of you had the privilege of teaching. Miss Plew had James back in the day. And Robert. And so many others. You think about it. And there they are serving God today. Not just in full-time service, man. We have kids that have come to the youth group that are just full-time Christians. Think about Dave back there. He was in pastor's youth group. Wanted to sing. Had to cut his hair in order to do it. But look at him today. Helped our church walk through a different part of history and still is leadership that is there and we should never discount the fellow laborers that we have it's so important it's so important in that and here he's looking at him he said this is my son in the faith and that he chose him personally to complete the ministry task in, in Crete why? because he knew he could do it Look at verse number five. He says, for this cause le uh, left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain the elders in every city as I have appointed thee. Paul was telling him, he says, hey, I left the right man in charge. You're going to be okay. I'm getting ready to give you some instruction." but you're going to be just fine. Why is that? 
because Paul had already walked that way. And Paul knew, boy, it's so important for us to understand this introduction to Paul. Let me ask you a question. When you say your name, can you say after it, servant of God? Are you truly God's servant? Are you truly sold out to him? Paul recognized himself as a servant. He just didn't recognize that. It wasn't a braggadocious statement. He just said, I'm God's servant. And secondly, he recognized the faith that he had. It was a sure faith. It was an anchor. Do you have the faith to be a servant of God? What about preaching? Do you try to find other things to do? Do you come in when it's time to preach and decide to read the bulletin or to look at something else or to play with your phone? And preaching, it's, it's the most important thing. And do you recognize the need for fellow laborers? We can't do it by ourselves. You look back there at all that sound stuff back there, all those monitors, TVs, everything. It's hard for one man to do it. It's probably hard for two men to do it. I know Josh is back there somewhere. There he is. Okay. They're asking for help. How would you like? To see this on Sunday morning. Brother Josh getting up and says, okay, well the choir is going to sing. Most of you would be going. But you know what? You encourage people. It's pretty good. Aren't you glad we don't have just one instrument that plays, but several people using their talents? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. You should come in here during elementary band practice. You'll understand joyful noise. But isn't it precious to see a young lady that's learning to play the piano to come and use her talents? She played a beautiful piece tonight. I love the flute piece that she played. I love watching our kids play. They're awesome. All of them are better than I am. I'm a basic trumpet player. That's it. That's it. Man, some of these kids, whew, that Johnson kid, whew, what a lip. Sorry, that's what trumpet players talk to somebody who really knows how to play. Sorry. <laughs> He's not a, well, yeah, he is a smart aleck at times too. So, and uh, you could quote me on that. But he's as handsome as all get out. But you see that. And then what if you were the only Sunday school teacher that we had? And we sent all the first through sixth grade for you to teach alone. Aren't you glad we have fellow laborers? It's important. And as Paul is making his introduction, he's, he's setting Titus up for things that he's going to talk about. The rest of the book breaks down this way. 